are at Marinkas Island today with the architect, the man, Harry Schrader. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us and uh, for walking the property with us. Thanks for having me. I, I'm so glad to be here with you and this is a really special place for me. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to walk it with you. Awesome. Can you start off by, by telling us a little bit about the, the gated entry? Sure. Uh, you know, the idea of arriving at a piece of property like this and being challenged to author every detail from the minute we arrive um, is something I, I cherished. And uh, to be back here after all these years and to see how all the details have held up and how the initial signature of the house starts at the beginning of this sort of um, uh, pathway to, to the architecture is something that uh, I enjoy seeing. Uh, you know, being being challenged or being um, tasked to to think about the little details is something that I think we'll find throughout the, the project. And I've just enjoyed so much the idea that an architect can take a spectacular piece of land <laughs> that uh, is one of a kind and to be given the responsibility to, to uh, steward that vision uh, is something that you know, I just, I couldn't be more proud of. You know, I, I think the, as we walk down this driveway, it, it brings back a lot of memories for me about uh, the Mermans uh, bringing me here. And it was a completely undeveloped piece of land, heavily wooded, uh, nothing had ever been constructed on the property. And for them to um, provide that kind of canvas and to say, how do we arrive at the building site? How do we craft a driveway that is about this resort discovery? And how do we amend the hardscape with gardens and very intentional pedestrian pathways through this beautiful land and, and having all these vistas out onto the lake? They're second to none. <laughs> you know. Uh, we're going to spend five minutes before we even see architecture and we've seen the best part of this property uh, before we even get to the house. So I think that's pretty special. What's so unique about this property is it effectively is an island with a land bridge. And so the procession that we're taking right now is through a neck and uh, that provided us this initial opportunity to get beautiful water views to east and west, which I think is so spectacular. But then as the property widens and we start to get to where the logical building pad is, we uh, introduce these intentional pedestrian crosswalks that would basically suggest that the, the, the storyline is not just the house, but it's the, uh, it's the property, it's these special moments that occur throughout the land. Um, we very intentionally worked with a landscape architect to think about these sequences and ways that the, the uh, client could use the property and much like a resort, find their way into these special spots, whether it's a fire pit here or the tennis court there, there's really this well-conceived idea of how they were gonna use this special land. Was there always a plan, uh, I've noticed a lot of, uh, of sculptures, um, was there always an intentional plan of where those sculptures were gonna be? Um, did they, like, were, did the sculptures that are here now, was that always supposed to be here or did you just kind of intentionally say, hey, we wanna design some spots for you yeah. for later? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think one of the things that was clear from the beginning was that the client had a sophisticated eye for art and for architecture. And I took that responsibility so seriously because, you know, I was at the beginning stages of my firm's existence. Uh, I believed in what we were capable of accomplishing, but it was their 100% their trust and their belief that we could marry land, nature, architecture, sculpture, to enhance this amazing experience. So to answer that question, I knew going in that they were collectors. I knew going in that they 
wanted to have these profound moments. And so when we laid out the land plan, when we, and you know, for an architect to, to be involved in the land plan, to, not just the footprint of where the house is, but how are we gonna experience the whole site, which I think is almost five acres, if I remember yeah. correctly. And to ultimately think about where a potting shed should be on the property, to think about where a reflective moment with a piece of sculpture and a, and a bench or you know this sort of a quiet respite space would be, which is not unintentional that it's on one side while the active side of the property, which is boats and tennis courts and um, activity are on the other, that was all thought through. And uh, it, it's one thing to dream about, it's another for the client to say, I'm on board, let's go for it. Let's actually do all that. Um, we were commenting earlier about this potting That's shed. That's more than a potting shed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think when you can uh, provide a signature in as many areas as possible, you know, that building is not meant to compete with the architecture of the main house, but it's meant to complement it. It's meant to feel like it's a support building, which also is located where it is so that we ease our way in so that we get this taste of the architecture. We get a, a, a little uh, gesture of design that someone would think, wow, that's a special little building and then lead our way into the to the, um, you know, punch line of, of the main house. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, as we, you'll see here, as you've documented, um, you know, there's no end to where the moments are on this property. Uh, I was saying to you earlier that, you know, when you think about a project as more than the physical structure and you think about the home as a place, as a, as a, uh, a concert of decisions, a concert of my abilities, with my clients' uh, tastes, with their, you know, avid attention to detail with gardening, you end up with something that's just at its own level. Truly a resort type yeah. property. Yeah. I, you know, I've lived on Lake Norman for a long time. Uh, I have such an affection for the place. And every time I'm on this piece of property, I forget for a minute that I'm in Charlotte. Yeah. I forget that um, we're just minutes away from our busy lives because the goal of this place even with their decision to title it yep. as Maracas Island, was a very conscious decision to create a, a place that afforded them um, a true retreat. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I feel like this property 20 plus years later continues to like resonate that philosophy. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Harry, before we head inside, could you tell us a little bit about this structure here? The doghouse? Yeah, that's sure. a doghouse? Yeah, that's a doghouse. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, picking up on our conversation about accessory structures on this property, uh, dogs were a big part of the client's life, and so they asked me to conceive of a, of a doghouse that would be conveniently located, properly shielded, and attractive. And so, uh, by all means, it's the most significant doghouse I've ever designed. Uh, it is, to my knowledge, the first doghouse requiring a building permit in Mecklenburg County. Wow. And, uh, you know, for me, even the littlest structure having the signature of the architecture of the house uh, played a part in the, the overall vibe. And uh, so, I, you know, seeing it after all these years kind of makes me chuckle because it's a significant little building. Pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah. Another point I'll make is uh, it's divided into multiple kennels. So they could, because the, the client was so um, attuned to other people visiting and right. having guests over. And so we designed it to where the stalls could be separated or joined depending on the temperament of the dogs. So they could bring their dogs. Yeah, exactly, which I think is hilarious. So That's thoughtful. Great. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's let's head into the house. Sounds great. So the dogs get a separate space. You know the guests are going to have a nice place. Oh, <laughs> so before we walk in, 
I think it's uh, appropriate to take a second and just talk about the architecture for the first time here. And uh, I, I love being back here. And the reason why I love being back here is because it brings back a flood of memories of design decisions that led me to an architecture that is 100% inspired by this land. It's organic in nature. It's shaped in such a way that it feels like it rises from the land as opposed to sitting uh, unnaturally on the land. And because the client gave me so much opportunity to think about texture and form and materials, it's appropriate that we, that we enter in in a space where uh, the arrival porch is a 30 second journey, you know, and where you enjoy these moments of architectural reference and nature reference and pocket park reference. Uh, undoubtedly, the use of stone uh, laid by incredibly talented masons is pretty much the backbone of this architecture. Uh, stone coming from the earth, holding up all the important elements of this house, which is traced through everything and is inside, is outside, is on landscape features. Uh, without really great rock work, we wouldn't be anywhere. And so this sequence of columns that lead us to the front door, carefully tapered by the way, which is really a subtlety that I don't miss when I come back and see this house, is, um, is setting the stage for the interior of this architecture. So if we kind of head in this way, you really can see the, the intention of creating like this really graceful, wide, protected entry um, in a way where you wanna pause for a minute. You wanna check out the water feature. You wanna see how the architecture engages with the, with the garden space. Uh, you know, that water feature is a direct lead into the uh, pool and its own sequence of water and stone. And while there's no doubt we relied heavily on the owners and landscapers to specify plant material, we did create these pockets so that they could enhance our architecture with softscape. And that plays a huge part into this process. Uh, it's, this front door remains one of my proudest uh, moments. It's beautiful. I'd never done a radius front door. Uh, I'd never done a custom leaded glass piece. I'd never done uh, stainless steel hardware. <laughs> and the, the, the chance to take the, the, the absolute moment where you go from outside to inside and make it something that exists one place on earth is something that I'll always cherish. How about Harry, can you share with us the inspiration behind this? Uh, I sure can, yeah. I, uh, I immediately think about the idea of the hearth being at the center of a home. Right. And so often when you arrive at a house, it's about immediately seeing through the house to the view. But because this house affords so many of these special moments to capture the view, we specifically wanted to create a pause point within the arrival sequence that focused on the hearth. And in its own way, it was representational of this family. Like, how do we create a home that is, uh, that is rooted in this sentiment of everything revolving around the hearth? And so off we went and we designed this uh, feature which incorporates the rock work uh, that I think is so critical to the stylistic direction of the home, uh, the craft of masonry is something that I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, but it also provided us an opportunity to introduce artwork into the composition. And so the owners enlisted a really talented artist by the name of Boris Tomich. And Boris, I didn't know prior to this project, but had done some significant work in Ballantyne at that main intersection there. 
Uh, I believe he's of Eastern European descent, and so there was this richness to his experience and to the storytelling of his artwork. And so we worked hand in hand to provide what I call the, the masonry canvas for him sure. and to integrate his work both in, in uh, complementary texture but also storyline of, uh, of what he was trying to accomplish as the counterpoint to my, to my fireplace. You know, one of the things I immediately come back to is the idea that we're able to design every aspect of this thing. So <clears throat> not only is it the, the, the stone itself, but it's the fireplace screen, it's the fireplace grate, uh, all requiring me working closely with a ironwork uh, shop in order to produce the detailing that I wanted. And there are design references throughout those pieces that link the whole signature together. Um, the fact that it's two-sided is really critical because what it does do is allude to another space that um, is its own contained uh, personality, but one that you can see visually links uh, the architecture. It's also at the end axis of the sequence we uh, use to come through that front door, and it becomes wayfinding measures to take us to other parts of the house. It's truly a, the whole fireplace is a work of art. I mean, the whole thing is just huge. It's Thanks. Gorgeous. So using that as a wayfinder, we should check out the kitchen? Yeah, let's go this way. Harry, the kitchen's the heart of the home. Yeah. So what was the uh, idea behind this kitchen and location and yeah. design? We, we looked really hard at locating spaces within this house that were gonna be directly related to view and sun. And what makes this property so unique is that we have this entire panoramic canvas to consider where rooms are best suited. We felt like the kitchen on the eastern side of the house would set up a rhythm of activity and sunlight in the morning hours, which was important to the okay. client. And as a departure point from sort of a, an internalized uh, experience at that fireplace, we wanted you to have this visual r release. And so much of what we see as we work our way through the kitchen and the family room is about expansive walls of glass that take us outside visually. Uh, and you'll find that oftentimes framing the views is as important as the architecture itself. Uh, and I think that's evident as we work our way this way. Uh, off the kitchen, uh, I've always loved this breakfast porch uh, because it is a intimate living space, a year round living space that allows them to bridge the gap between inside and outside and to get outside for their morning coffee. And uh, to know that they've used that, you know, almost every day uh, means we landed it in the right spot. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy about that. We move, move our way around uh, this second fireplace, which again was a chance to, to take a, a fresh look at a anchor feature, uh, much lighter and airier than the last one we looked at. Uh, and yet it sort of serves as an interesting kind of moderator between the kitchen space and the family room space. You know, so often architecture today is about creating the most open plan possible. And I respect that and design that often. Uh, but this architecture was about a balancing act between rooms that held their own and a, a continuity between spaces. So it's kind of connecting the two spaces. That's, that's the end game is to connect the spaces, but to use design features to give them their own sense of place within the house. Harry, tell us a little bit about this grand room that we're standing in now. This is one of my favorite rooms in the house for a lot of reasons. Uh, I 
love that it is a ultimate moment within the house where the inhabitant gets to take in the whole property. And that's intentional. What we really wanted was a room to feel like it was the destination. And so to stay in this room and get your first panoramic glimpse of the context of the property uh, makes me thrilled. Um, the other interesting part of this was that the, the site and the buildable area of the site begins to neck down at the point of the property. And so it was my chance to inch the footprint out into the boundary and to really kind of engage the most dramatic part of the property. And the other thing that strikes me about this room is it, it's uh, sunken down from the kitchen level intentionally to bring us close to the ground. I didn't want us to sit on a pedestal, I wanted us to sit in an, an engaged manner to the land. And I think that might be subliminal for most people, but it actually does have a impact on how you feel within the space. And even the fact that the wainscoting of this room is a stone base is this direct impression of, of kind of in, engaging us and wrapping us in the architecture as opposed to it being detached from all this uh, landscape. Uh, you know, I can't not mention that I've enjoyed so many Christmases in this room with my children as the clients have hosted a Santa uh, viewing party. And uh, so I have an emotional connection here and uh, it makes me happy to be back in it. Uh, you know, volume, and you mentioned or opened the comments with how grand the space is. And grand for me is defined by physical size. It, it can accommodate a lot of activity. It also has a good volume to it, being almost two stories or effectively two stories. But the introduction of materials, be it the, the bracing or the woodwork, the very visible soffit lines that are extended out to the, to the tune of like four feet maybe, are ways to, to uh, enhance the experience of being in the room, to take a volume that could feel vacuous and in a house of this size could easily become that and instead give us this sentiment of, of ultimate comfort in a room that's predominantly glass. And so that has um, held up well, in my opinion. I'm, I'm happy to be in the space and seeing how it's living. So. And Harry, I don't think I've ever been in a room where you can see the sunrise and the sunset from literally the same chair. Yeah, I, I love that you acknowledge that because it speaks volumes to this idea of how you can take the canvas of a piece of property like this and focus on those key moments. Find those spaces where a sunrise and a sunset would be appreciated. Uh, and so this room accomplishes that goal. It's interesting to have that discussion when you consider uh, the space adjacent to us, which is uh, far more protected from the sun. And that's also intentional because it's always been a music room and we had to protect the equipment that was in that room. And so quite logically, while we didn't want to take away from the, from the views, we wanted to create buffers to sun that give that room an entirely different personality. Can you show us that room? Absolutely, yeah. So I was thinking about this too, because um, I don't know how many, 10, maybe 12 different places we've done these things. And I was with Shed Brand, uh, who's the leaded glass company. I still work with them to this day. And we were kind of reminiscing about designing this. I, I designed all the leaded glass, but needed an expert to figure out how to actually do it. And this is all copper caming, which is extremely unique and expensive. And so from the standpoint of it being a a valuable asset to the architecture. I just need to reiterate that, I mean, those are key points that you're gonna find throughout the house. But th this door being something that could be completely concealed was our way of letting these spaces flow on the occasions they want them to flow, but then also being able to shut the room down when music's being played and they wanna have a more contained uh, acoustic environment here.
So the music room is us finding the backside of that foyer oriented fireplace. And it justifies why it's a see-through element and how we can use that anchor hearth component to our advantage, uh, whether we're arriving at the house or whether we're invited back into the more private, um, intimate rooms of the house. And uh, I, I love how substantial it is. I love how it's a counterpoint to the glazed wall to the view. And that's what good architecture should do. It should play both sides of maximizing the potential of the land, but also giving you a sense of comfort and warmth around key architectural features. Uh, knowing that they were using this for music prompted us to consider a softer environment, uh, a lower ceiling, uh, indirect lighting, which creates a, a mood. Uh, it um, is heavily shaded, and so we use this opportunity to wrap a significant porch around this room, which protects the instruments, but also gives them another uh, shaded component. We're westerly facing here, and so that roof line does a really good job of creating meaningful outdoor space that you're not baking in in the summer months. And uh, the, the fact that it doesn't have a dead end is critical for me too, and that there isn't a dead end within the floor plan so that we can create these circulation patterns that are effective if it's two people or if it's 52 people. And I can say I've been here on occasions where there was that many people and I loved seeing the activity flow that uh, showed that we'd, we'd gotten it right. The effort to bring this one stone in, mm -hmm. I mean, this house is built on slab. I don't know if you guys know that, but there, there's no crawl space here. And, but for the fact that we could drive heavy equipment on concrete, we would never have gotten that piece of stone in because it's several thousand pounds and the only way to get it in was to drive a bobcat in here and put that rock in place. How, at what she point could have done it? that on a crawl space foundation. No, I, I don't know how yeah. we would have done it. Yeah. Honestly. Wow. Well, at what point in the process was this installed? Was it? It was far enough along that we would have had a really hard time if it weren't concrete construction. Um, I think the Masons were here for a year and so we worked our way from inside to outside as the weather permitted. But once they mobilized to do this rock work, we procured that actual stone. Like we, we found the stone I wanted to use here and knew that it would be a crazy challenge to get it, get it installed. Harry, where did the stone for this house come from? It's a... Uh, what type of stone is it? Or? Yeah, it's a field stone that, to my recollection, does come from the Carolinas. Carolinas, okay. Uh, the mason we used has done several projects for me over the years and is a long-standing, preeminent mason. Uh, and they used a big crew, and it was not just putting rock up. It was actually crafting the rock, especially since so many of the forms are angles. Right. So when you have an angle wall, they have to chisel the faces to that angle. And there's, you know, countless areas where I challenge them to do that. And they cursed me often, but they are <laughs> proud of it in the proud end. Proud of the end result. Yeah. Yeah, that's just spectacular. Come upstairs, we're introduced to this lovely landing, uh, and it's it's kind of the dividing point of the, the upstairs to, to go one way to the primary and the other way to the secondary bedrooms. So can you tell us a little bit about the thought process behind that? Yeah, absolutely. The This overlook serves several functions. Uh, maybe my favorite function is that it gives us a perch to enjoy the sculpture of the fireplace and 
These railings uh, are a fun exercise for me too because we were thinking, why not introduce this dual wood vocabulary that you see throughout the house, whether it's built-ins, the interior doors, the cabinetry. So we explored a unique railing theme. Uh, again, really excited that it got executed because I think it's, it's easy to bail out and have a railing be a railing. Yeah. But if the railing can be an extension of the space and if it can create this elegance as we look over the sculpture of the fireplace, some significant art pieces. I've always envisioned this as a gallery as opposed to just circulation. And then equally important is the fact that we're back on axis, right? A lot of this house is about these axial relationships so that you feel a very clear sense of circulation and special moments. And so we had it at the front entry and now we have it directly above the front entry. So this glass here is giving us this axial shot back into the property. And I think that's a really interesting way for everybody who's experiencing the second floor to have this dual, uh, this dual, you know, uh, moment between the architecture on the inside and the natural setting on the outside. And to your point, yes, it divides two areas of the house. We have the primary suite occupying its own area, its own personality, and then the other side of the house is where we made sure to accommodate uh, some fairly spectacular guest suites. Everything, every space in this house has a uh, water view, and that's also intentional and really a responsibility that I should take when I'm given this kind of uh, property to take advantage of. I want all of these rooms to feel like they are one of a kind experiences. They're all truly spectacular. And we're in the primary owner suite now, Harry. Yeah, yeah, uh, pretty special spot. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the opportunity to design furniture uh, is on display here. You designed the furniture? I did. did yeah, you know that? I did. Uh, they uh, wanted a significant primary suite, but I also love that I can uh, play a part in the experience of the suite and that it's not just about a box that they furnish. And so a, a lot of uh, very distinct effort went into creating a sense of a place here as well. Um, a, a bed chamber within the larger space is really the derivative of stepping up onto a soft carpeted platform, changing our ceiling detail, uh, introducing the softness of a curve, which I think is a soothing geometry when you're about to uh, call it a day. Uh, and then, you know, this, this uh, impression of what is it look like for the architecture of the bed to grow from the building as opposed to it being a separate furnished piece. And so uh, I had a, another great time designing this, this unique thing. Uh, the, 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 the room is an Eastern facing uh, room and our sentiment always was, how do we start the day on the right foot right. essentially? And so all this glass and uh, a little uh, uh, overlook balcony. Yeah. How do we how do we give them those features to feel like they're really enjoying that resort setting? And uh, you know, I find it really interesting that this many years later, those decisions have held up aesthetically. I think the room feels well proportioned. It feels comfortable, uh, and it doesn't lack for the drama that we set out to accomplish there. It's large but not overwhelming. Yeah. And this kind of softens it. It absolutely does, yeah. The elevated platform gives just a slightly improved perspective over the balcony to the water, and that's intentional too. The compressed ceiling height is also a function of the fact that you're laying at three feet above the ground, and so we don't need vacuous ceilings. We can bring that scale down. We can bring the texture of wood down to to embrace cozy you. Feel. Yeah, exactly. Yep. 
This is an interesting feature too. Uh, obviously, the bookcases were uh, a direct consideration for how to add their personality and character to the space. But what I also find fun about it is it's a hidden link to our library overlook. And so to me, knowing that they would have a way to enjoy another space quickly and efficiently and privately uh, played a big part. It also gives them a second means of egress in the event of an emergency, they have a, another way to get out of the house without having to go back through the main spaces. Wow. Let's take a quick look at this. Yeah. So this is a fun little discovery to be made off the master suite. And this is that loft library that looks down into the main family room space. And I, I love the chance to let people uh, interact with the space at a different level, right? So we're now up in the rafters of this place. Uh, it's got a great overlook feel. It's got another more modest um, uh, nook to find your way into a, a book and looking out at the lake. And so uh, the owners were, were really excited about having this annex to their primary suite. So morning light played a really big part in how we developed this sequence of spaces. Uh, starting with the idea that uh, the homeowner wakes up early in the morning and wanted to really feel connected to that morning sunshine across the lake. And so from this space, we uh, created this very uh, intentional resort style sequence of spaces that include dressing, closets, showers, uh, so that it was very, uh, uh, natural sequence from their bedroom space to the bathroom. But more importantly, we created a direct connection point to the exercise gym so that they could uh, easily flow without having to go into the public parts of the house and use their gym. And then one step farther to take them from that gym down a back stair that leads to the indoor pool. So really all their morning activities are linked across this eastern facade of the house. Um, Harry, let's talk about this amazing light fixture. Yeah, uh, I don't know what I was thinking here. I, I really loved that we could look at a formal dining experience and what it would mean to manipulate the ceiling and incorporate the light fixture as part of that design. And none of it's possible without an open-minded client. Uh, what we ended up thinking would be dramatic and beautiful would be to bring the scale down, you know, to, to create intimacy within a big uh, room by creating this uh, plenum of design that drew, drew your eye down to the dining space. It also gave me all sorts of cool ways to incorporate materials and, and backlit lighting. And for that all to work, uh, it required me to study this uh, stainless steel fixture, uh, which is a uh, uh, challenge I can't even begin to tell you. You know, I want to say it's six, seven hundred pounds. Uh, it required working with a machine shop because each one of those fins is solid stainless steel. And uh, the, the hope is that it brought a increased level of richness to the experience with the forms, with the levels of lighting that it provides. The whole center section is a, a mesh to create this diffused romantic light and um, it's, it's limited in its light output so that we can keep the more intense light around the perimeter and then soften it across the table. Uh, it's, you know, it's been 20 plus years uh, and I still uh, am so uh, excited about the steps it took to pull that thing off. And the spectacular views from the dining room. 
Yeah, the, the, we've talked about sense of place and I really believe this is one of those rooms that is intended to create an introverted, reflective, uh, uh, you know, introspective vibe. And it's very balanced and very organized. And the windows, which do link directly to the views, also link to some of those exterior uh, patio sequences. And so the dining room is as impressive from the outside of this house as it is from the inside. It becomes this iconic prow towards the eastern side of the property. Well, now we're sitting down in this comfortable pool lounge area. What was, what was the thought process behind this room? We work to create a space that was directly connected to the pool and function of the pool. Uh, a room that certainly capitalizes on this sense of overlook. Uh, it's also interesting in that it provides these layered views because we're grounded by the fact that we can see out into the arrival sequence. Uh, what its primary purpose was, was to create another more intimate space that uh, linked the pool activities to the spa activities. And so directly around the corner is not only our staircase that leads us to the gymnasium, which sits right above us and has a, a view back down into the pool, but it also is where that whole morning routine can revolve around exercise and swimming and sauna and outdoor shower and lake activities. So much of this program here on this side of the house is about linking the functionality of the inside to the uh, amenity of the lake and we always felt like we needed to have spaces that had their own personality and this does that this gives it its own uh, quiet uh, reflective nature uh, and I just love the fact that water is the grounding element of the experience in this room well we can see the pool from here Let's actually go check it out. Sounds great. Harry, can you tell us the inspiration behind the indoor pool? Sure. Uh, I know that the client was interested in having a pool as part of their daily exercise regimen. And an indoor pool represents a whole bunch of challenges, uh, aesthetically, technically, uh, and we located it on the eastern side of the site so that it would get that morning daylight. From a design perspective, we wanted to create a space that was more aesthetic than functional. And so we really did design a highly customized pool and waterfall experience. Uh, first one of my career that I worked on like that. And uh, I, I knew that it would be a room that was used daily. And so we put a lot of effort into connecting it into the stylistic DNA of the architecture. One of my favorite parts is that glass corner because if one of our overriding goals is to design architecture that uh, blends in with the nature, right. uh, we wanted to make such a significant uh, gesture towards that by letting the wall sort of disappear and leading the eye out into the landscape and to ultimately the, the lake. So, had a lot of fun designing this room. So you're taking the inside out and bringing the outside in with that corner? 100%, yeah, yep. One of my favorite features of the house is the waterfall, and you designed that, right? I did, yeah. From scratch. Yeah, uh, they gave me boundless opportunities to be creative, and at every turn, I would ask the question, hey, can I explore this idea? And they would say, absolutely. And I remember specifically when it came to this waterfall, having this idea in my mind, 
but needing to design it uh, real time. Right. And so I put a ladder down in the empty pool during construction with a roll of blue tape and I block by block masked out the ledges and the waterfall feature to, to end up with a composition that I could both show the client right. and have a uh, contractor build. Uh, the other part of it is that waterfall does a really good job of concealing the guts of, an, of a mechanical system that makes this room work. Um, and so it was just a, a great way to draw an aesthetic cue um, to a service area of the building. To have a big function as well. What's to that? have a function as well. Yeah, to have a function as well. And the, the other thing I find interesting about this space has always been how we relate to the arrival sequence and there's a significant water feature outside, but I wanted there to be at least a symbolic gesture that that water outside was making its way into the pool itself, and that's where the second waterfall came into being. So, yeah. The use of water is significant in this project uh, because it has such an organic quality, whether it's the sound or the, the texture. And so one of the things about that was this sense, although symbolic, that the water that you enjoy upon arriving at the front door finds its way down into this interior pool. And so we just had a, a blast being able to think through how those elements could be played together. Harry, for this to be an indoor pool and, and to be so beautiful, you really thought through the process of making sure that there were endless options to explore the outdoor space as well. Let's take a look outside. Absolutely, yeah. So I love where we're standing right here because it has such a dramatic impact on this transition between indoor and outdoor space. And this uh, most significant overhang is this um, gesture towards like a tenuous relationship between this big structure and the site itself. And the glass corner, which was a feat of engineering to pull off, is the most respectful way I know how to link indoor and outdoor by taking that water's edge right to the glass and then setting us up for our connection to the land. Outdoor spaces, uh, pockets of outdoor spaces that range from two person to 20 people are an integral part of the flow on the outside of the house. And this sort of Eastern setup links all of those functions from the guest house and tennis court to the pool itself, to the primary outdoor dining spaces, to the boat dock. And so we really, uh, I love that we're compressed underneath this roof overhang and feel this sense of connection as we make our way across the side of the house. Harry, one of my favorite parts is the guest house, which feels like you're at a resort. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the chance to build a, a significant second structure uh, does a lot of things architecturally. Uh, it meets their program requirements for some pretty uh, special uh, guest quarters that include bedrooms and kitchens, uh, an awesome patio space overlooking the lake. But it also serves uh, to uh, house garages, uh, a, a massive um, equipment hub for a generator. And so when all those program pieces came together, the idea was uh, that it would be more effective if it all happened in an accessory structure versus embedding it in the main house. And it does a few things. It, it takes greater advantage of the property. It allows the scale of the structures to be, you know, on the, um, manageable size as opposed to overwhelmingly large. It gives them distinct program for long-term guests that's more private than if it were a bedroom in the main house. But it also did a really cool thing which it allowed me to uh, create 
distinct markers of circulation across the property. And so, you know, as I mentioned previously, the idea of, of uh, pathways that have destination. Some of the destinations lead us to sculpture gardens. Some of the destinations lead us to this uh, pavilion, which, you know, you yeah. mentioned it being resort style, very intentional. The idea that we have this uh, walkway that leads us through to the tennis court yeah. is non-residential in nature. You know, there's no point to have a front door. So let's make it a very apparent um, open air uh, loggia that leads us to that cool tennis court. We also use that building to screen the noise of the tennis court. And so it, it is all about creating uh, the function they need in the best aesthetic manner that I could right. think of. Harry, we appreciate so much you coming out here today uh, to give us a personalized tour of Marenka's Island and, and kind of let us see uh, the behind the curtains and what it was like to, to be a part of such a special, special project. I appreciate you inviting me. Uh, this opportunity to walk back through a house that has meant so much to me, uh, not just as uh, an uh, important commission, but also as a uh, lifelong friendship um, with the folks who enjoyed it, but also the house itself. Uh, it's like coming back and seeing an old friend. And um, it's just incredibly special to spend the time with you and um, to reflect on some of the things that matter to me. Um, and I really genuinely hope that it matters to the next uh, family that decides to make this home. So thank you very much. Thank you, I'm sure it will. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.